Hello, <clears throat> I'm Charles Geisler, Emeritus Professor in Development Sociology at Cornell. Welcome. There can be little doubt uh, that over the past five centuries, Europeans have enclosed the global commons and for sure in the process incorporated whole continents of Aboriginal land. Today, we welcome you to a webinar exploring the question of land-grant colleges and universities as participants, participants in this question of land-grant and land-grab. Our focus is on our own university, Cornell, the largest recipient of land grants, about 10% of the total, and of the revenue benefits, as you'll hear more in the webinar, about 33%. Professors such as myself and many of you in the audience, I would imagine, have been beneficiaries of this deeply fraught subsidy over the last 150 years. Before retiring, I worked on native land possession and frankly, to my great lament, I largely overlooked the topic we're discussing today. <clears throat> so I'm, I'm exceedingly glad to see it come into its own. Let me extend some thanks before we move on. We're grateful to the Cornell Association of Professors Emeritus, CAPE, for hosting and facilitating this webinar, and in particular to Cynthia Robinson for her fine assistance throughout. There's really a lot of background preparation uh, to acknowledge here. Thanks to the American Indian Program and the Indigenous Studies Program here at Cornell, otherwise known as ASP, for tireless work on so many topics relevant to the Cornell community, including today's. And thank you, you in the audience, for taking deep and we hope abiding interest in this subject. I'm omitting the most important thanks. Let me acknowledge the native Kono homelands upon which this university is built. And we'll put up a slide at the moment. And I'd like you to read it and absorb it a bit. So we're gonna pause here. The slide, please. Let me introduce <clears throat> the two panelists or speakers. Kirk Jordan, uh, Associate Professor in the Department of Anthropology at Cornell and currently the Director of ASP. Uh, right after Kurt will come John Parmeter, Associate Professor in the Department of His History and ASP. Uh, both of these professors have done sustained work and teaching contributing to ASP and its success on our campus. Several ground rules for the talk that's about to begin. Um, if you have questions, please submit them via chat to me. Uh, I'll sort through them and hopefully we can get at all or most of them after the comments by Kurt and John. As far as muting, uh, you are probably muted now. If not, you surely will be so that any background rustling won't uh, disrupt the uh, comments by our two speakers. And should you be interested, CAPE is recording what's going on today. And if you look in chat, you'll be able to see how to get at that recording in case you wish to refer it to somebody or listen to it at a later time. Uh, that said, again, thanks for joining us. This is very meaningful. It's a turning point in Cornell's uh, social academic community history. Uh, we welcome it. Kurt, I turn things over to you. Thanks, Chuck. Um, so uh, definitely, thanks, Chuck, for the, uh, for the introduction for this session and to CAPE for hosting our presentation. 
Um, certainly, we are at a very fraught time in uh, American history. Um, this, this year, this summer and fall, this week. Uh, but I think that one of the things that uh, the staff and faculty and students and alumni at ACE have really uh, been arguing in this uh, fraught season is that we need to uh, maintain an emphasis on indigenous concerns um, because they're very fundamental to uh, the structure of inequality in uh, the United States today. Uh, the, and of course, as we're going to outline here, they're really very fundamental to the, uh, to the founding and the operation of Cornell in particular. Um, I show this, this, uh, this oil painting here, uh, John Gass, American Progress. It's somewhat overused in indigenous studies, but I think that this is the view of American history uh, that many of us uh, uh, were taught uh, as youngsters uh, and, and uh, many people, it's the only version that they, uh, that they, uh, that they obtain. Um, I also think that we uh, in general have a vision of the history of the university that is very consistent with this, uh, where it's sort of the march of progress in knowledge uh, and, and things are getting better and better all the time. But what we need to, um, I think, stress is that there is uh, an entanglement with a legacy of viol violence and dispossession that was directed at indigenous peoples in the past and to a certain degree continues today. Um, and then also that uh, based on President Pollock's, Pollock's messages this year, uh, that Cornell really, uh, she sort of tasked us in a certain way with coming to terms with, uh, with Cornell's historical legacy and its current participation in systems of oppression. So that's really part of what, uh, what we're trying to do here uh, uh, today. So one of the things I think that this sort of um, uh, vision of, pro of pure progress, uh, uh, history is pure progress, one of the things that that does is it tends to cover up um, the, uh, the, the history of indigenous dispossession and violence. In fact, I would sort of say that, uh, that, that it tends to sort of sweep that under the rug. People tend to say, Oh, that happened a long time ago. Uh, what does that have to do with us? Um, and, uh, and that's a very, very common reaction, uh, which overlooks, I think, the ties to the way things are today and the ongoing effects, uh, uh, both to the benefit of settlers and to the detriment of indigenous peoples. The tendency to sort of paper over or sweep under the rug this, this somewhat uh, uh, unpleasant history and replace it with a uh, uh, really a celebratory narrative is part and parcel of what many indigenous studies scholars call settler colonialism. This is one aspect of it. Uh, part of it is to take uh, land and resources away from native people to sort of turn it into settler uh, lands, but it's also to sort of naturalize this. And also I think in certain ways to legalize the dispossession of indigenous peoples through laws, court cases, congressional actions, executive actions, what have you. So this is, a, it's a really, it's, a, it's fairly systematic um, and, and as a consequence, uh, this, this history is really obscured to most, uh, observ uh, most American observers. So one of the things that really brought this to many people's attention was an article that was published in March uh, in, the, uh, in the journal High Country News. It was uh, uh, um, authored by uh, the indigenous, uh, ac the Kiowa academic uh, journalist, ac uh, excuse me, journalist, Tristan Atone and the, uh, and the uh, academic historian, Robert Lee, but they uh, published the results of a long-term study where they looked at the roots of the entire land grant university system as being very fundamentally based in indigenous dispossession. And in that article, and I certainly it's, uh, it's available online, I encourage all of you to, uh, to take a look out of it, uh, uh, at it. Uh, Cornell is very specifically called out, uh, as Chuck mentioned, as the largest recipient of Morrill Act lands and also the school that made by far the most money from those lands. And you can see a couple of graphics from that, uh, from that article that we've sort of combined here today, but you can see how the bar for Cornell's profit is significantly higher than, uh, than any of the other land grant uh, institutions. 
So one of the things that uh, at ASP we decided that we needed to act on this information and we formed a, a project called the Cornell University and Indigenous Dispossession Project. And the, uh, the membership there uh, consists of these, uh, of these nine scholars. Um, uh, we're, we're about, uh, I guess we're actually slightly over half of the members here are indigenous themselves. Um, and we've been sort of researching, writing, and, uh, um, and we've established a blog on, uh, with a, which presents the results of our research and, and some, uh, some videos of lectures, um, uh, some infographics, that sort of thing. Uh, and so this is an ongoing uh, project. And, if, uh, and Cindy, if you could put the link to that, uh, that blog in the chat, that would be great so that everyone would have it. John, I'm going to let you talk about the Moral Act process. Okay, well, thanks, Kurt. And I'd also like to say thanks to Chuck and to Kate for hosting us today. Uh, it's a pleasure to be able to talk to everybody here. Um, a lot of times, you know, people, the Moral Act, uh, you know, as Kurt mentioned, that it really was the High Country News article that, that was very arresting and, and got us thinking about this here. Um, essentially, what the Moral Land Grant College Act did in 1862 was at a time when the federal government was cash poor, um, it used what were called at the time public lands, which is essentially land taken from indigenous people through treaty surrenders. Um, and it turned that into a resource to build these um, land grant colleges, which were specifically intended to be um, set aside for teaching um, the agricultural and mechanic arts, which at the time was what they called engineering. Um, this was very forward-looking legislation at the time. It was designed to kind of create um, a different sort of university, one that was responsive to the needs of people. Um, and it used a very interesting mechanism um, to do so, okay? I, like I said, the federal government did not have money to sort of throw around at this point in time, but what they did have um, were rather vast reserves of public land. So states, um, Essentially, these are states west of the Mississippi River at the time that had federal public land within their borders, um, were essentially had, had a portion of that turned over to them based on their congressional representation for development purposes. The majority of states east of the Mississippi River, like New York, got something different, okay? They were awarded um, scrip um, which is essentially a form of coupon that could be used to claim public land in other states. Okay, so the idea here was that Congress granted the script to the states. The states had the option to manage it for the university or go and sell the script on the open market. Um, those of you who are familiar with American history would probably remember that 1862 also witnessed the Homestead Act, um, which essentially granted a lot of free land uh, available to settlers. So what happened here is that the script um, did not really even meet its face value most of the time. It was an unfamiliar commodity in the eastern states. People didn't really know what to make of it. And the vast majority of states who got script chose very quickly to dump it on the open market at a discount. It had a face value of $1.25 per acre. Um, many states sold their script on the open market to speculators at a discount, took the money and went with it. Cornell, um, Ezra Cornell and the institution he founded, as we'll see in a few minutes here, did something very different. Um, um, Ezra had a very different vision for this. And as we'll see in a second here, um, he managed uh, a great deal of profit from this initial grant from the federal government. So at the time, um, states were awarded the script or the land acreage based on the size of their congressional delegation. New York had the largest congressional delegation at that point in time. Um, also remember this is a Civil War truncated Congress, so that was kind of important too. Um, finally, after the Civil, was Civil War was over, 
They did extend gradually these provisions to former Confederate states as part of the reconstruction process. And as a result of the 1862 Morrill Act, there were about 52 schools eventually funded with this process. Okay. Um, Kurt, if you wouldn't mind moving it the slide, that would be great. So the um, authors of the High Country News article um, essentially took all of the New York State script and mapped out where it was entered and located. Okay, and their totals um, have land placements in 15 different states um, with the, the specific acreage there. Um, my own research into this um, left me with a bit of a question about that, uh, and I'm gonna try to make a distinction about this a little bit later on. Um, what Cornell did that was different was rather than dump most of the script on the open market to speculators who took it all over the place, um, Ezra Cornell personally, with the assistance of several agents, took it upon himself to select, enter, and manage sizable properties in three states, Wisconsin, Minnesota, and Kansas. Um, those were places where this uh, was directly um, managed by Cornell. The other states that you see listed there, California, Michigan, Colorado, Iowa, et cetera, um, those placements are with New York script, but it was script that was later sold on the open market. And I'll talk a little bit about that distinction um, in a few minutes here as we move on to that part of the presentation. Kurt, you're muted. Oh yes, of course, inevitably. Yeah. Um, so uh, we, part of the reason that the project coming out of American Indian and Indigenous Studies is called Cornell University and Indigenous Dispossession is because we realized very quickly that we couldn't just consider the Morrill Act lands. If we were talking about uh, Indigenous lands that had been uh, used and managed by the university, we clearly had to talk about things that were happening within New York State, uh, you know, the Ithaca campus um, and, and, other, uh, and other facilities. And this is a, a quotation here that comes from the uh, frequently asked questions part of the Cornell um, Office of Real Estate. And you can see that they talk about the scope of Cornell's holdings uh, really nationally here. So we have the central campus of 745 acres. Uh, we have about 11,000 acres total in Tompkins County or about 4% of the county's lands overall. There are another 6,000 acres elsewhere in New York 2,000 acres that are still held by Cornell across the country. Um, and then there's also, the university also retains over 400,000 acres of mineral rights, uh, particularly in the central and southwestern states. So if we were saying that there's sort of a moral obligation, excuse me, it's a, it's a bit of a pun, you know, so uh, uh, moral and moral. Um, if we have a moral obligation to deal with the moral act lands, then certainly we need to consider the other lands uh, uh, that Cornell has used, manipulated, and continues to use uh, in the state in the same way. There really are research, and John uh, John's research has really been absolutely critical to this. We've come to the point where we think that we have about four categories of land, and I'm going to discuss them individually, so I won't spend too much time on this particular uh, particular slide. But basically, we have uh, lands within New York State, those lands that were uh, located and acquired by Ezra Cornell for uh, and managed uh, quite extensively for the benefit of the university. We have the other script, which was sold to speculators, and then the speculators, rather than the university, managed it for their own benefit. And then we also have land, a fourth category of lands outside New York State, where Cornell continues to hold rights. So just, I'm gonna show you a few different maps here. Um, this is a one list of Cornell properties and you can see that they're scattered throughout the state. Um, obviously this includes Cornell Agritech in Geneva. There are a number of, uh, we think, can think about the Arnott Forest. We can think about research, uh, re research locations, um, experimental farms, et cetera, et cetera. 
this was one Cornell held uh, GIS resource that was uh, that a student of John and mine has uh, sort of prepared this map, uh, Dusty Bridges, and we're really indebted to her for a lot of the map work that, we're, that we've used for the project. But I noted that this is quite incomplete. It does not include the New York City campuses, so Cornell Tech and Cornell Weill Medical Center. And also, I think significantly, it does not include the cooperative extension offices, which are present in just about every county in the United, in, not in the United States, in New York State. So if we, um, if, if we think about Cornell's impact on the state, I think that there's really, we have impacted every single indigenous group uh, that had their traditional homelands within the borders of New York. And we have to consider uh, our, I think, indebtedness in some ways uh, to those communities. The next group, this is what John's gonna talk about uh, in, in a bit more detail. These are the places where Ezra Cornell directly, um, uh, you know, uh, entered, claimed, and managed uh, lands. And as he, as he mentioned before, uh, these were in Wisconsin, Minnesota, and Kansas. And I'm really going to let John talk about this. That's really what the bulk of today's presentation will be about. Then we have the ones where Ezra uh, uh, Cornell sold the script. This was really, I believe the trustees of the university said, it's 1868, we need operating funds right now. We don't have time for you to sort of go out and find lands and manage them. We need the cash right away. So Ezra sold them uh, to a Cleveland-based speculator. Uh, and, then, and then the Cleveland-based speculator had all of these script certificates and went out and found land parcels and, um, uh, you know, and, and uh, manipulated those and sold them for his own benefit. So Cornell's uh, ties to these are a little less direct, less intensive, less invasive than the ones that uh, were originally uh, the, uh, uh, managed by Ezra Cornell. And I guess it's interesting to note here that there are both Ezra managed lands and speculator lands in Wisconsin, Minnesota, and Kansas. So it's a very, very complicated process. But you can see here that we're really entangled with indigenous groups on a continental scale. This is not a regional problem, but the way, the way that the Morrill Act worked, we have uh, Cornell is entangled with lands uh, really all across the nation. And then the last category, I would say that we really don't know the, this is really what we know the least about at this point. So that we know that there are, um, that there's continued mineral rights uh, and perhaps property outside New York state in areas that were not acquired through the Morrill Act. Um, we're not entirely sure how Cornell got uh, some of these mineral rights and or lands. Some of them may, be, may have been donations uh, uh, from alumni or others. Uh, again, I think this is something that we still need to do a bit more research. Um, and so we, we do know that there are some mineral and drilling rights in Texas. Uh, a lot of the mineral rights, as John will detail, are actually from the original Ezra managed Morrill Act lands. Um, and again, I think we have to be concerned with all of these lands just as much as the ones in New York State or the Morrill Act lands. All of them came to to Cornell through indigenous dispossession. And we have benefited as an institution and for many of the people in the audience as individuals through this indigenous dispossession. Um, and, and it's something that needs to be uh, acknowledged. So John, I'm, I'll let you uh, talk more about sort of Ezra Cornell's actions. Oh, okay, great. So, I mean, this, you know, and, and I'll just say, you know, I've been at Cornell for um, 17 years and it, was a real shock for me to, to read that High Country News article and realize that all of this had been hiding in plain sight all around me for all that period of time. Um, it's, it's quite a phenomenal story when you get into it and begin looking at the scale of, of what goes on here. Um, so essentially what happens is New York State receives um, a little over 6,000 pieces of Morrill Act land script on May 5th of 1863. Uh, Mr. Cornell at the time um, had been thinking about building a library in Tompkins County. That was his original goal. That was what he wanted to do. Um, he and his fellow state legislator at the time, Andrew White, began talking about how this might be optimized for the creation of a land grant college under the terms of the Morrill Act. So what Mr. Cornell did 
at the time um, was start writing letters, start reaching out to people and trying to figure out if there would be a way to make money for the university from, um, from the land strip. And what he figured out was that a long-term hold of land acquired with the strip, predominantly timberland, um, was a way to basically generate substantial profits with this resource given by the federal government. Okay, um, and he undertook what my predecessor in the history department, I, I never met Professor Gates, he passed on before I got here, uh, but apparently he was quite a legendary figure in the history department. Um, and he wrote an early study of this particular process. Um, he refers to it as one of the largest land speculations in American history. And it is quite a, quite a phenomenal story. The scale of it is, is really quite incredible. Um, I also think it's very important to point out here that um, Mr. Cornell, Ezra, came under some scrutiny during his life uh, about what was happening with the revenues from this particular endeavor. Um, and it's been shown beyond a doubt that Mr. Cornell, um, every penny of what came in from the Morrill Act as profit went to the institution. Okay, he in fact assumed a great deal of financial risk uh, in the process. Uh, all of the revenues went to the university. There were several uh, legal battles related to this. Um, and it's, it's clear that Mr. Cornell did not profit in any way personally from this. The revenues that were brought in all went to the university. And I think it's important to just make sure that that's clear to everyone. Um, could you move? So this is an example and the resolution here isn't, isn't great, um, but this is an example of the kinds of documents um, that exist. Um, boxes and boxes of these are in the archives at Proc Library. On the left, you sort of see um, the government issued script, okay? And that's basically a coupon for 160 acres of public land anywhere in the country, okay? You could take it and go to a local land office and once you identified um, what was at the time called a quarter section, which is a 160 acre track. Um, you could enter it and then you would get the document on the right hand side, which is a location certificate um, that basically specifies what range, what township, um, where the land is that's associated with that particular piece of strip. Um, so um, this is kind of just a, a showpiece example that the archives has handy. Um, but there are um, over 5,000 pieces of this paper in the archives here. Every bit and piece is, is accommodated. So this is sort of the, the way that it kind of worked on the ground. I mean, that this bundle of paper, the certificates on the left, um, uh, Mr. Cornell uh, purchased from New York State and then worked with agents predominantly in Wisconsin to locate valuable tracts of timberland and enter it with the certificates on the right. Um, and then as we'll see in a moment here, you know, that's where the profits begin to kind of come in. You can move it. So by August of 1866, um, Mr. Cornell had purchased all but 475 pieces of New York's original allocation. New York State, the state comptroller, sold those 475 pieces um, at a discount after, after receipt. Um, and then Mr. Cornell stepped in and essentially purchased the rest, okay? Um, it's also important to point out here that there was something very um, unique about what happened even after that, okay? Mr. Cornell was a state senator in 1866. And at the time he arranged for some enabling legislation that allowed his activity to bypass some of the restrictions on the use of funds in the original Morrill Act. So this was another kind of innovation that was undertaken uh, by Mr. Cornell. Effectively, what ended up happening was he worked out a deal with the state comptroller to essentially say he would pay 30 cents an acre down and then another 30 cents an acre 
uh, upon sale to bring the purchase price up to 60 cents, but any subsequent revenue brought in from that acreage that exceeded 60 cents per acre went into a separate fund. And some of those acreage sales were as much as they averaged about $9 per acre. There were some that were $80 per acre. So this is where you see the incredible opportunity for profit taking that happened as a result of this particular enabling legislation. There were two funds created, the land strip fund, which basically was the 60 cents per acre figure and it had the moral act restrictions applied to it. Okay, there were, you couldn't really use it for anything except for some basic operating costs at the university. You couldn't even use it to build buildings. Um, the profits that came in above 60 cents per acre were unrestricted and went into a separate, in called, a separate fund called the Cornell Endowment Fund. And that is where, you know, the real opportunity for profit taking and profit making happened with this particular endeavor. So the year between 1866 and 1867 was extraordinarily busy for Mr. Cornell and his agents, again, particularly in Wisconsin. Um, about 3,200 pieces of script were used to acquire over a half million acres in Wisconsin, Minnesota, and Kansas by the end of the year in 1867. And I've actually been working in um, just this week and last week in the university archives in the records of the land committee. And the volume of correspondence on this is, is just fascinating um, to sort of see. I mean, three and four letters a day, some days, um, every piece of script discussed and where are we gonna put it? and we should put it here and it's in this range and that range, mistakes made in the paperwork. I mean, it's, it's really an incredible undertaking to, to sort of begin to try and understand. You can move the, but as Kurt pointed out earlier, by the time we got to the end of 1867, um, Professor White and the trustees of the university were rather anxious for some operating revenue um, again, you have to basically appreciate that what Mr. Cornell was doing with the script was effectively a long-term hold, uh, a buy low and hopefully sell high later, okay? Um, so the script, you know, which he paid 60 cents per acre to New York State and held for the benefit of the university on the promise of later sales and revenues as we'll see from timber and, and whatever. But the balance of the script that he had on hand um, in 1868 was sold in a couple of different parcels to a Cleveland-based dealer um, named Thomas Gleason, who worked with Mr. Cornell to essentially um, corner the market on all land strip um, that was outstanding from universities at this point in time. I'm Gleason went and bought it from everybody, and he became the sole basically the sole dealer who had it. So he had his own particular agenda. Um, a lot of the New York script that ended up in Gleason's hands were those parcels that are associated with Cornell by the High Country News um, article. Um, the parcels that are uh, certainly the exclusively the parcels that are outside of Wisconsin, Minnesota, and Kansas are these speculator parcels. And as Kurt pointed out, there are some within those three states that are speculator parcels too. The benefits that came to the university from those were at the time of sale. So basically what happened was that in 1868, um, Mr. Cornell and the university basically agreed to do their own version of a, a, a dump for profit of what the script was on hand. So they got um, about, 90 cents per acre um, from Gleason for that. So they were, there was some profit from that. And that went into what was called the land strip fund subject to the terms of the Morrill Act. But the much greater proportion of the script had already by that point in time been located and entered and was actually physically existing as acreage in Wisconsin, Minnesota and Kansas that was then managed for profit um, specifically timber harvesting 
um, for the most part later on. And that's, so this basically um, is a map and this is kind of the preliminary map. Um, since this has been produced, um, we've actually found a couple of additional land surrenders um, where Cornell has directly located parcels. But basically what you see here in the colored splotches on the map are particular land surrenders that are associated with particular treaties. Um, there's a very straightforward process by which the government has defined and identified these. Um, they're called Royce session areas after the Smithsonian cartographer who took it upon himself in the 19th century to actually draw the maps of the surrenders that were associated. And again, the resolution here is not terribly great, but you can sort of see the little black dots are essentially where Cornell located parcels exist. And you see them in, in this case, seven different surrenders. We've actually in the last week or so have, I have identified two more. So it's actually a total of nine um, different surrenders. And I believe it is um, eight different indigenous nations we have identified as sort of the primary signatories here. So you can kind of see here um, an Osage Treaty from 1825, uh, another treaty with the Kansas in 1825 down in Kansas. Wisconsin, you see um, what's now Wisconsin, you see a couple of very big surrenders with uh, Ojibwe people. Um, and then also uh, a very significant Sioux Treaty that was signed, two Sioux Treaties that were signed in 1851. Um, the other two surrenders that we have identified both came in 1837. Um, so this is sort of where, you know, where my particular interest in this issue has kind of sort of landed is trying to sort of understand, you know, what the stakes were for the people who gave up those particular tracts of land in treaties with the federal government. And what really shocked me uh, as a student, you know, I've taught Native American history here for 17 years. I, I thought I understood it pretty well. These particular treaties were almost universally sig very significant turning points. And I'll say it, turning points for the worse for the people involved. Um, almost well, every single one of these treaties has some legal problems associated with it, um, and, with them. And, and it's, it's, it's quite, a, it's, it's another whole angle to the story that I really think you know, my own personal research is gonna be looking into for the next probably couple of years to try and sort of untangle and, and talk about that. But those are the particular sessions that we see here where um, that yielded lands that Cornell University directly selected, profited from, managed. Um, and the land committee that, that did this um, operated until 1935. So they were sort of working on this um, and finally um, had liquidated all the land uh, by 1935. You can go to the next one, Kurt. So just as a shorthand here to think about the costs and benefits, um, here's some figures and sort of things to think about here. Um, so indigenous lands taken in actually it's nine different surrenders uh, between 1825 and 1851. Um, what really is, is fascinating to me and what I'm really sort of curious to look into a bit more are what I'm calling the dispossession histories of those affected communities um, who gave up that particular land um, in terms of you know, what happened to them afterwards, um, secondary removals, uh, reduced economic opportunity uh, and embroilment in the war. And many of the Santee Sioux people who signed that 1851 treaty were dispersed into Canada after uh, the so-called Dakota War of 1862. Um, I really don't think we're gonna find out for sure what the costs of all that will be until we find a way to begin a consultation process with some of the descendant communities and have them tell us uh, a bit more about what these particular dispossessions have meant to them historically. We can get at it to a certain point from reading books and, and what have you, but I think there's no substitute for actually engaging in some conversations with these communities 
and we're, <coughs> excuse me, talking as a program about how to do that, you know, right now. On the other side, you can sort of see what the benefits are. And this is where the nitty gritty, this is where the money, this is where people sort of need to understand what the, you know, the financial and the fiscal implications of all of this are. So basically the land strip fund um, that has the restrictions of the Morrill Act on it generated um, at the time slightly under $700,000 and it's held by the state as an endowment and New York State to this day um, sends Cornell about a $35,000 per year annual interest payment on that initial um, endowment, okay? And that's kind of the level this was at for most other land grant colleges, okay? Again, in the 19th century, that's big money, okay? Over time, it's sort of dwindled in significance. What Cornell had done with the enabling legislation that freed up the balance of profit over and above 60 cents per acre was that as of 1923, there were about $5 million in unrestricted monies in the Cornell Endowment Fund. That translates into just about $77 million, $2020, okay? So now we can see that this is where the real money is. The university's own um, financial committee uh, issued a report uh, back in the 1990s that talked about the Morrill Act lands um, as the author, um, his name was Michael Whalen, put it, uh, fueling the operation of the university for most of the 19th century, okay? Um, this was really the, um, the money that kept Cornell open during those years. After the 20, turn of the 20th century, other revenue streams came in and this particular one diminished in significance, but it still continues to the um, current day. I can say uh, as a result of some re very recent conversations with the real estate office that there are mineral rights retained on a portion of formal act, uh, former Moral Act acreage. All of it is in Wisconsin. The exact nature of the acreage and the value um, of these particular mineral rights is still awaiting, um, quite frankly, access to the office where the files are. Um, the real estate office um, are non-essential and they're closed right now. But I would point out, and I would certainly want to say that their staff has been very helpful to me and very open and transparent with this information, okay? So we know that there are mineral rights that have been retained on lands acquired by the Morrill Act that were subsequently sold by the university, but yet these mineral rights were retained. I don't know why. Um, I don't know what the rationale was. I'm hoping I can find that out with my own, um, with my own research that's ongoing. And that's, that's where that one is. <laughs> okay, um, John, I'm gonna go back to the treaties for a second. I think yeah. it's probably worth um, underscoring for this audience sort of what, the, what, it, what a treaty means in this context. Uh, we know from the constitution that treaties are mm -hmm. allegedly the, the highest law <laughs> of the land. Uh, but most of these, uh, you know, I guess I'm gonna say a couple words and then maybe if you wanna, sure. if you wanna uh, uh, supplement that. These were inevitably violence-backed. They were not. Uh, they were not conducted in a situation where uh, where many of the ind uh, indigenous groups had any negotiating power whatsoever. Uh, there was uh, widespread fraud. Uh, there were people who were not appropriate signatories who uh, that the U.S. got to sign these treaties just to push them through. Um, that, and then even the, uh, the terms of the treaties where the United States committed to certain um, uh, services and uh, uh, you know, that the United States has almost to, uh, uh, to every last one of these has not fulfilled its obligations that it spelled out uh, in the treaties. Mm -hmm. So, um, I, and I, I, you know, so these are, this was really um, these were, uh, to certain degrees, swindles. I, I think I don't. I don't know whether you'd agree with that term. Yeah, I, I think that's fair to say. I think you know the thing that always that stands out for me are, are the sheer size of these surrenders. I mean, these are massive sessions. This was a period of time. You know, these all came in one of the very significant eras of you know early national nation building, and. 
these people were, you know, the, the United States negotiators in these treaties were out to get the largest possible surrender they could for the least amount of money and commitments um, at any given point in time. Uh, it is certainly true that the commitments that the United States made in virtually all of these um, have not been fulfilled, um, whether it's in terms of compensation or um, services provided, what have you. These are straight up dispossession treaties. Um, it was essentially designed to push native people out of the way of desired areas for settlement or in the case of Wisconsin, um, in particular, and Minnesota to some extent too, uh, mineral development, okay? Um, the big green session up there from the 1842 treaty is all uh, about Lake Superior copper mining. So there's, there's all kinds of stories entangled with these. I mean, I mean, I've just really sort of begun to scratch the surface on it, but, but every single one of these treaties was, was a, a fundamental turning point for the nation involved. Um, their, their lives were forever changed by these surrenders. Thanks, John. Um, and I guess I will also mention that if you look across the full roster of the uh, sessions that, uh, that ended up being associated with Cornell, uh, there are several of those treaties that were never ratified by the Senate. There are some instances where there's no treaty whatsoever. Um, so that, you know, there's, there's a, lot of, uh, a lot of things where the, um, the you know, the, the sort of the, the uh, there were strings left uh, uh, in, if you look at it, even through the context of U.S. law. Okay, um, so... I'll say a couple of words to wrap up here about sort of uh, the actions that ASP is envisioning to sort of follow up on these legacies. Um, so, but I think that we have to remember uh, really the, the somewhat sordid uh, um, situations, uh, the, the disingenuous actions by the United States that took these lands that ended up being uh, used for Cornell's benefits. And so to a certain degree, I think we can see these indigenous communities across the continent as being uh, the original stakeholders of the university. It's very, um, it may seem like it would be a fairly simple uh, uh, act to sort of look at the people who signed these treaties and then, uh, and then figure out who they are today, but it's not as easy as it might seem that there was an enormous amount of historical and social change between then and today. So as John mentioned before, indigenous groups in many cases were displaced. Many, many were pushed into Oklahoma, uh, different parts uh, you know, out of their traditional territories, some across the, uh, across the border into Canada. Groups were also broken apart. In some cases, groups consolidated, often because there had been significant loss of life to disease and violence, and they simply no longer had viable communities. This is particularly true in California where there was a very active program of state-sponsored genocide. In some cases, some of the groups that were part of the original uh, signatories have been wiped out completely. Um, as part of this process, through the colonial process, there are others that no longer have federal recognition. And I think we have to see that as a part of the process of colonialism. Uh, and, and that these groups who, even though they do not have status uh, with the federal government are still uh, you, you know, deserving of our attention. We've been trying to put a tally together of the nations that were affected by Cornell's actions in some ways. And we are currently at 137. As you can see, there are roughly 27 communities affected by Cornell's actions in New York state, 46 communities affected by those parcels that John discussed that were directly managed uh, by Ezra Cornell and a further 64 communities affected by parcels obtained and managed by speculators. Um, this number, uh, as more research is done, this number undoubtedly will go up. I think we can certainly be looking at 150 or more and I'm not really sure what the ceiling is, but really um, this, we're dealing with an awful, uh, awfully large proportion of the indigenous groups that are in the United States today were in fact entangled with Cornell in one way or another. So what we've dis what ASP is committed to is we feel that we do have a moral obligation, that Cornell has a moral obligation 
uh, to understand these issues and to investigate in consultation with these affected communities what uh, a proper form of remedy or redress might be. And this is in keeping with the, uh, with the president's remarks, uh, her most recent set of remarks on racial justice uh, um, uh, in the United States uh, really talks about the need to make a formal statement about the, uh, this legacy of dispossession and also to be in, in contact with the affected communities. This is likely to be a very long process. As I, as I said, the first step is to figure out who the communities are in the first place. Uh, obviously, we don't have uh, formal uh, relationships with the vast majority of these nations uh, uh, at the present time. So we will have to develop a process for that. Um, and, uh, uh, and the protocols are very different from nation to nation. This is not gonna be easy and it's going to be a lengthy, uh, a lengthy issue. We certainly can look at the actions of other land grant universities. Um, uh, Cornell is not alone in this and there are many universities who are sort of investigating their legacies. Um, some of them have it simpler than Cornell does. If we think about Berkeley, for example, who has been very active, all of the lands that they received through the Morrill Act are within the state of California. They have formal relationships already with most of those groups and simply need to use pre-existing channels. Uh, Cornell doesn't have that luxury and we obviously have the hugely complicated factor of having to deal with groups in, uh, in uh, originally in 15 states and even more widely spread uh, than that today. So some of the possibilities, and I'm drawing here on a very uh, helpful presentation by uh, Beth Rose Middleton, who's a professor in the University of California system that she made in a forum that Berkeley sponsored in September. Um, and we've sort of added to that, but some of the things I think that have to be on the table uh, that, that uh, need to be discussed and considered are things like investing in, in, in indigenous students through things like scholarships, financial aid, or tuition waivers. Again, we're not saying that any of these are going to be uh, necessarily uh, uh, with uh, Cornell, but really what the end product of our indigenous, uh, the, uh, the indigenous dispossession project is really to approach uh, the, uh, the university with a set of requests or demands that uh, have, been, have been come up with in consultation with affected communities in order to uh, do something that Cornell can do something that will be useful and in part make up for, uh, for uh, Cornell's benefit from the dispossession of indigenous communities. We can also look at things like investing in indigenous studies, education and research uh, through expanding the number of faculty who teach in our program uh, moving from a program to a uh, department, moving from a minor to a major, just so that we can be certain that Cornellians of the future and also members of the general public will not have these gaps in their understanding of indigenous history and the institution's history. There are things like public statements and land acknowledgements, um, uh, and certainly the university, the president's office is committed to making a public statement on that uh, uh, on that uh, on this issue, and we're going to need to uh, we intend to check in on them and talk about sort of where they are with that and what the exact procedures would be. Uh, institutions like Berkeley have opened the possibility of land transfer of of university lands to indigenous nations in certain circumstances. Financial transfer is another option. Another uh, possibility is co-management agreements or easements so that indigenous nations can use and may have access to university owned lands uh, that, uh, much more easily than they do now. We also have to consider the issue of putting up monuments, uh, also the names of buildings um, are, are also, I, I think, so either new ones or possibly renaming old buildings uh, on, on uh, campuses. And then obviously, I think that, that part of this has to be building community engagements and collaborations, which is something that we're very actively, uh, um, you, you know, we're at the early stages, but we're certainly if, uh, intending to do that. Um, uh, we're, we're doing that as we speak. So that's really uh, the end of our formal presentation. I'm going to stop sharing my screen and we will uh, have the, uh, the, the panelists come back up here and our moderator, uh, Charles Geisler, will, uh, will, will devote some time uh, for questions. Obviously we're coming right up about on 3.30.
So, um, so the um, uh, what, what we're going to do is um, we're, we're willing to stay a little bit longer to answer a few of our questions, but we certainly recognize that many of you have uh, other obligations and you should feel free to duck out when you need to. But yeah. Chuck, I'll turn it over to you. Uh, thank you, Kurt and John, uh, and everybody else who works with you and around you in the program whom we haven't acknowledged <clears throat> yet today. Uh, this is this is so affirmative to see what you're doing and the depth that you're going into and understanding it not just in our backyard here in New York State or Tompkins County but on a continental scale. Um, I, one of the questions that came back and I think we could just quickly remind uh, listeners who came on perhaps late and didn't hear this why did Cornell get the lion's share of the land script? And then we'll move to another question. John? Size of the congressional delegation. That was how it was allocated. New York State had the largest congressional delegation. I think it had 33 people um, in Congress, uh, representatives and senators, and that led out to a proportional amount of acreage that was bigger than anybody else's. Thank you. Um, either of you, um, how about other states? If they got a smaller allocation, were they as aggressive, thoughtful, speculatively acute? Uh, how would you compare other states with New York State? I, I would say that, that no other state comes close to what New York State did, not even close. Um, some of the public land states in the West um, still have their moral act lands and are still profiting from them directly. Um, managing them, you know, um, as public, you know, as, as a private resource, as real estate, mm -hmm. but they didn't get as big of a chunk as Cornell did, um, because at the time they were very small. Um, so that that really is the difference um, in that particular case. Yeah, there's. I, I guess I'd mentioned that there's a, been a couple of follow up articles uh, in, in High Country News um, that sort of talk about, um, the, I guess, the mineral rights that have been owned by some of the Western land grant uh, institutions. Uh, I think that they they didn't know about Cornell's continued mineral rights uh, when that when that uh, when that article was published, but. Uh, but but uh, but there's certainly you know I think that the many of the Western um, land grants are still making substantial benefits, uh, but but Cornell really is the is the big daddy so to speak. Yeah. It's it's unique, and it, I I really think that you know, it's it's in, in many ways it is the story of moral act as possession. My my soul panics a little bit to think that this story might have broken and we didn't have an ACE program to respond. And this just kind of went by us because we didn't have the research interest uh, going to the archives and mm -hmm. things that are now occurring. I think uh, stepping back from your presentation, one of the things that uh, I and the audience probably have the most trouble uh, understanding, thinking of your fourfold uh, breakout of the different kinds of script uh, uses and land consolidation, one of the questions is, um, where do the Cayugas fit into the moral script? Can you explain that disconnect one more time? Yeah, I could. I'll, I'll take that one on. So, um, the Moral Act was own, uh, awarded script for federally owned "quote unquote" public land. Um, in uh, there was no federally owned public land within New York State at that time because of previous dispossessions. New York State had dispossessed the Haudenosaunee, the Six Nations Iroquois, uh, to give lands to revolutionary soldiers because the state was uh, was uh, cash poor. There were massive sales to speculators, um, the Holland Land Company being a very prominent example. Um, so there was no public land in New York State, uh, but that you know, as we've said, that that doesn't mean that you know we we don't Cornell doesn't have a moral obligation to just the moral uh, land grant act lands we have to we have to consider every piece of territory that Cornell has been entangled with. I did notice one of the questions that uh, that flashed by me just recently is uh, uh, somebody asked about you know is Cornell directly implicated in the dispossession. Um, the, the answer is no, uh, because the federal government took all of these lands 
but the, this is not, that does not erase Cornell's obligations. We still have benefited in an extremely direct way uh, that this is the foundation of our endowment. It's the operating, co uh, operating funds of, of Cornell. Uh, certainly if we look at uh, Gaiacono or Cayuga lands, these are the lands that we're operating on right now. Um, and this is, we are getting benefit from the fact that, the, that indigenous peoples were dispossessed. Indigenous people still have an ongoing relationship to the land and the waters here. Uh, they're, uh, they're, in many cases, their spiritual systems are tied to particular tracts of land. They're tied to particular ecosystems. One of the things that John talked about uh, briefly was the timbering in Wisconsin that basically Cornell's actions completely changed the ecosystem in, uh, in, in Wisconsin and many of the Ojibwe nations that were, uh, that, whose traditional territories that were there, their whole cultural system is based on an ecosystem that no longer exists because of Cornell. So the idea here is that we do not get a pass because the federal government, uh, the federal government uh, uh, was the one that actually did the acquisition. Uh, that, that we, it, it is to our benefit. And as President Pollack asked, uh, uh, asked us, we need to have a moral reckoning with these legacies, uh, with, with both historical and contemporary. And that's the reason why we're framing the issue as we did. It, I'm, this wasn't asked by one in our audience, but I wanna follow on because I, I know it's important to you folks in the program. And that is, uh, how are you, um, what are you hearing from the Six Nations here in New York State? And how are you accommodating those concerns along with your own, our own research interests? I think, um, you know, again, this is at a very early stage. Um, this is something they obviously have strong opinions about Cornell's actions uh, and our treatment of, uh, of our treatment of their homelands. Um, and, and I think we have not really sort of, we, we are at the very initial stages of um, approaching them specifically within this framework to talk about uh, modes of redress and things like that. Uh, and they're, they're what, what the community feels is appropriate. I think that will happen more quickly than some of the other outreach endeavors because we do have established channels of connection with the Haudenosaunee nations. Uh, but I was, uh, you know, I would just as an example, I was drafting a formal letter uh, to uh, to the Gaiacono leadership uh, that I'm probably going to send out later today, where we start really sort of a formal consideration of exactly these issues, rather than just sort of, you know, general ideas that that Cornell's in our territory, right? John, you uh, wound up your comments uh, talking about uh, what you feel at least to, to date, has been a receptive response on the part of our Cornell president um, elsewhere in the university. Um, could I get you, could I draw you out a little more on the receptivity? That's one of the questions that has come at us. And I want to refer, uh, well, and then translate that into uh, kind of operations and meaningful yeah. behavior. I, I think that's I mean, we've had some good conversations with, um, we had one with President Pollock and a number of people from Day Hall. Um, uh, that was what, September sometime, I think, um, when we were just really at the beginning of all, of all this, getting it sorted out. Um, since then, you know, um, Kurt and myself have been working with um, the Vice Provost for Land Grant Affairs, Catherine McComas, and Catherine's been very um, receptive and helpful to to us in making contacts with appropriate uh, places in the university um, for for information. Um, you know, again, specifically the real estate office uh, on the mineral rights question is something that we've been able to we've gotten further on that than um, we than, than many of us suspected we would. Um, but in terms of a material um, commitment of, on any part by the administration, I don't think we're quite there yet. And I think, you know, Kurt could maybe speak to that a bit, but um, there's been lots of um, positive reaction and we, no one's like, you know, tried to silence us or anything like that, but we're still kind of waiting for, and, and we have some things on our own end to kind of get in order before we would go with any sort of particular 
um, requests and what have you. But, but, you know, so far, I think that, you know, I've been quite impressed with the way people have responded and we'll hope it continues. Yeah, I, I, will, I will make an, an additional comment here. I think that, you know, although we are going to be in the long term making a formal set of requests, I can look through the list of attendees here today and I can see quite a few of them. There are, there are many emeritus, uh, uh, emeritus folks, but there are also a fair number of people who are still in Cornell, uh, active at Cornell and administering programs of various sorts. And one of the things I would say is don't wait for our recommendations. If there are things that you can do immediately just within your own college, your own program, your own unit, what have you. Um, this is something I guess, uh, you, you know, we, I, I would certainly welcome communications about this from people, but we don't need to wait. There are lots of things that we can sort of say, okay, if we address this, if we rec recognize that this is problematic, there are actions that we can take within our own units uh, that, will, uh, that, that can uh, start to remedy these concerns. Uh, so you don't have to wait to act. Thanks. Oh, thank you. Um, I'm going to, um, as a final question, I somehow feel it would be a dereliction of duty if we didn't ask ourselves since land grant slash land grab um, is pretty tough-minded language. What are we learning even in these initial stages? Um, do we have a more nuanced understanding of how land grabbing works um, as we confront this Morill and uh, then the in-state Cayuga and, and other dispossessions and displacements that have gone on. I, I wanna know kind of uh, both about the material things that will happen, you've spoken to that, but at the somewhat more abstract but important level of what is a land grab and why is this one or a series of them? Are we learning something there? I, I'll answer, try to answer that briefly here. I think one of the things that really sort of um, struck me as I was doing my research on this is that the scholarship on the history of American public lands to date has really basically ignored the primary sort of source of where those lands came from. It's accepted as a given that these lands, you know, came from um, surrenders by foreign crowns, okay? And there's no discussion at all of the process, the grind that the treaty, the dispossession treaties represented throughout most of the 19th century, some in the 18th century too. And, and I think that is really the thing for me that this really, you know, from an just a purely intellectual standpoint um, will be a contribution here. I think that that people be much more mindful of the fact that you know public land does not equal free land or a given or mm -hmm. something that sort of just materializes as a magical resource that the federal government can dispose of and distribute. That I think understanding the backstory to that is really the critical thing here, um, and I think that's moving forward. What hopefully this will at least raise some awareness um, in in all of that. I mean. Really, the public land scholarship talks about Native American um, possession uh, almost not at all. And I'll, I'll, uh, I'll, ch yeah, I'll, I'll chime in here as, as well. Um, so I think that we can also look at universities um, and especially land grant ones as a microcosm for every institution and every property holder in the United States, um, that this is that this is, uh, uh, you, you know, I think I think we can, you know, I own I own a, ho a house on a small piece of property, and I'm, you know, I I feel that I'm implicated in this uh, as well. I'm benefiting from the dispossession of Indigenous peoples. Um, the reason that I am able to, uh, you know, have this wealth that I can pass down to my children, and and Indigenous peoples are marginalized. The Gayakono have no official reservation in New York State. Health conditions are terrible. Um, there's, you know, there are a lot of problems, and we can really put those uh, the the marginal position of Indigenous peoples today very very squarely on the on the uh, the land loss. So yes, it's a, I think it's an unquieting, th a disquieting thing for everyone. The other thing that I think that uh, that uh, universities can do 
is we can view this as a moral obligation and we can act sort of as a beacon in this particular, uh, in this particular process. And you can see that the president has done exactly this. We are not, this is not a legal argument. The, le the US legal system has pretty well made it so that there, you know, that, that dispossession is, uh, you know, the, it's, it's the law of the land, right? That there are many ways that the uh, that US settler law has papered over this process and made it perfectly okay. But that doesn't make it morally okay. Um, and I think that what universities can do, and where, and I hope that Cornell could become a leader in this particular respect, is that we would uh, take on this moral obligation and really look at it seriously and do something in a material, tangible way that addresses how the university and most of the people on the call have benefited uh, from indigenous dispossession. Lovely, lovely closing comments. Uh, <clears throat> I've learned an awful lot and my uh, apologies to those of you who sent in questions that we haven't addressed. Uh, I encourage you to look at those questions. There's some excellent suggestions for what Cornell and other universities can do um, and other follow-up questions that are terrific. Thanks again, all of you and CAPE. Yeah, thank you for being here.